Hi, and welcome to According to Pete. It is January. Today, we're gonna talk about current mirrors um, and where you might find them and what you might use them for, or sort of, kind of. Um, so, let's dig in. <laughs> in general, what a current mirror is used for uh, is regulating current over here with something else over here. I have a circuit set up here, and this is comprised of a self-biased MOSFET um, and a biasing resistance. You know what the current is through this component. Therefore, you should know exactly what the current is through this component. You, you, you set your uh, CMOS device uh, or, or your transistor device uh, to self-bias, okay? And the voltage that'll be across this guy, in the case of uh, CMOS, is the threshold voltage of the device itself, plus the minimum on voltage uh, drained to source of this component, okay? So when you know that voltage, and you know your source voltage, then you calculate a resistor that makes all that happen. All other things being equal, if you, if you know everything about this component, and you know everything about this component, and in fact, the two components are identical, the current will be the same through this device as it is through this device. This can also be set up with transistors, okay? And the voltage is just a little bit different, right? Because this is a BJT, and you know that the voltage from here to here is going to be, depending on the chemistry or, you know, the, the whatever this device is made of, uh, it could be 0.7 volts or 0.6 volts or 0.3 volts, right? So I'll, I'll just say 0 0.7 volts, right? So then you calculate your R bias in a similar fashion, okay? And if you know the current through here, you know the current through here. Practically speaking, when you're using this circuit, you can scale the current by changing the dimensions of the channel of the, of the second device. And they call this one M1, this one M2, okay? So if you've got dimensions known of this device and you scale it in, in a similar fashion uh, or larger, you will get a larger current. And we'll call this one I1 and this one I2. This is your input current and your output current. You guys know that I don't like scaring people with big, long, hairy math bits. I'm not a math guy unless I have to be. But being that a current mirror is uh, used largely in analog CMOS design, I want to show you some of the things that go into it. So the relationship of your output current, I2, to your input current, I1, is, generally speaking, L, L1, L, L1, W2 over L2, W1. And these are the dimensions of the channels of the two devices, okay? Times your gate to source voltage minus the threshold voltage of M2 over gate to source voltage, threshold voltage minus threshold voltage of M1 squared <laughs> times uh, this quantity, which is one plus uh, lambda VDS2 over one plus lambda VDS1. Lambda is a channel modulation parameter. It has to do with how much current is going through it. Uh, it has to do with temperature. Um, so, the, and then there's uh, times K prime two over K prime one. And K prime is um, a transconductance parameter of the device, okay? Assuming that your current mirror exists on a single IC die, this all goes away. And you're left with just the dimensions of this thing. Now, as soon as you start working with discrete components, you gotta worry about this one, you gotta worry about this one, you gotta worry about K prime. And in all likelihood, you're never gonna get access to those numbers. If you really care about this being an accurate calculation at all, Current mirrors don't really apply themselves or lend themselves very well to discrete components at all. One of the problems with setting this up uh, with discrete components is something called thermal runaway, which you may know about, you may not know about. Um, so for example, if I had set this circuit up, um, there's, there's no feedback back here, right? With, with this, I've got like temperature that's feeding back to the other circuit and, and it'll stabilize sort of kind of maybe. 
Um, this guy will not. Uh, in fact, the more current you try to drive this one with, the hotter it will get and the more current it will try to pass. So there's no real current regulation going on there. Let's talk about the actual thing, right? The question, the question in uh, the comments was, um, how would I use a current mirror for, say, regulating a current through a string of LEDs? This is our hypothetical circuit current mirror set up to regulate a current through some LEDs. The first problem you're going to run into, uh, I believe, or the first thing on my list of problems uh, is thermal runaway, which I've already described, right? Um, at, at a high current, this sucker is probably going to warm up, especially given that you're not going to be just running two LEDs. You're probably going to be running like a lot of LEDs. And so this voltage up here might be, you know, uh, 48 volts. So thermal runaway is going to be something uh, you're, you're going to be concerned about. And like I say, there's no feedback here. That's what, <laughs> that's where our problem lies. The second problem is scaling. Okay. So from the equation that I showed you and, and from what I've been talking about, um, you're never going to know the, the, the particulars about this device with regard to the particulars about this device. I mean, you can get uh, just, you know, you can get two transistors that are the same part number and they will not have the exact same parameters. It just doesn't happen that way. I set this up as a low side, but you can set these up as a high side with a P, P device as well. Uh, if I was going to, if I really wanted to do this, right? If I really wanted to impress my friends with using a current mirror to set this up, I would not even bother trying to calculate the, the currents, I would just set this up as a bias circuit, see what I got over here and call it good or adjust this value until I get the current I want. Power considerations. The first thing that comes to mind is that I've got this extra current over here that's really not doing anything substantial, right? I'm just dumping current in this branch because I can. Second is this device. This is a really inefficient thing, especially when you're talking about high currents, right? Because uh, like in the CMOS design, um, when they set up current mirrors, they're usually only talking about real small currents, like in the microamp or 10 microamps or 100 microamps range, small stuff. If we're doing this, we're talking about, you know, 350 milliamps or more that's, that you're driving through this thing, okay? So this sucker's going to heat up. If you if you plan on varying the number of LEDs, it won't work to just have a load resistor in here. But if I was setting this up and I knew what this was and I knew how many of these were, I would really just, you know, for simplest uh, reasons, I would use a power resistor and just call it good. Take a black box view of this circuit, right? This guy, racha. This device here, we'll call him Q2 and we'll call this one Q1. Q2 does not care anything about what's going on over here, right? All Q1 and this resistor are doing is setting up a bias voltage on the base of Q2. That's it, right? You don't need all of this. You could just as effectively do this with a resistor and a diode or just a, a resistor divider. It doesn't take much to bias that thing, and it does not need anything like a current mirror, okay? And, you know, you can, you can set that branch value to whatever you want. It doesn't have to, you know, it, it's not too terribly important. And at that point, of course, I might really just use a load resistor. Like I was saying, this is inefficient for this, uh, because anything extra that the LEDs aren't taking is going to come across either Q2 or a load resistor, right? For that reason, I would really go with some kind of switching regulator that limited the current. They're really efficient. And the reason that they're really efficient is because they're storing energy in an inductor that is only released when it's needed. Okay. So it's not dumping tons of wattage on a power resistor or, or a power <laughs> transistor as the case may be. Backing this all the way back to the original question. I would not use a current mirror for the application of driving LEDs. Sounds good in practice, but when you look at it, uh, I don't think it lends itself too very well to this application. And uh, my take is that current mirrors in general do not lend themselves very well to discrete components. That being said, 
you can do it. And it's sort of a cool thing to do once in a while. Is there a reasonable application to do that beyond impressing your geek friends? I can't think of one. Um, and I've talked to the other engineers and we're all like, why would you do this? I don't know. So um, there's the point of conversation for the comments. Can you guys think of a reasonable thing to do with a discrete current mirror? And I've searched the web and I found a couple of examples, but they don't really go into a practical application. They're just describing what it is and what it does. And one of them said, yeah, you, to get these things equalized, you gotta glue them together. So the temperature, yeah. That probably wasn't as helpful as I wish it had been with regard to current mirrors, but that's my experience with current mirrors. And I would love to have the conversation in the comment section. So that's Current Mirrors. Hope you dug it. Uh, don't forget to check us out uh, on Twitter at Spark Fun, at, sorry, uh, at SFE underscore engineering or the general Spark Fun uh, uh, account, which is just at Spark Fun. And as always, uh, keep your questions and comments coming. You can forward them or send them to uh, our email account, which is uh, feedback at sparkfun.com with according to Pete in the subject line. Or you can put your questions in the comment section down the yard. And until next time, see ya. I'm zoning out. Hang on. Uh, Did you have any gray in your beard when we first started doing this? I don't know. <laughs>